Hello and welcome, welcome, welcome. So glad y'all are here. We had, I had a whole bunch of people sign up. A lot of people, like 500 people. So I'm excited to see you guys and your friendly faces. And, um, and I'm excited to be here tonight and chatting with you. And I, um, I'd love to hear you guys questions in the chat um and or the q a and i'm just excited to to be with you guys tonight and we're going to cover a lot of material we're going to go over um i mean you guys registered so you know kind of what i'm planning on doing and we're going to dive right into a whole lot of wonderful things and try to help you guys get your bearings um, so that you are a better able to digest and process the information um, that you're reading or being exposed to in regards to herbal medicine. Um, so yeah, awesome. So people are still kind of coming in pretty quickly. So we'll kind of wait, but while we're waiting, I will go ahead and start with an introduction. So I'm Cameron, I'm Cameron Strauss. I am a clinical functional herbalist. I have been in clinical practice for 10 years. I have been a student of herbalism and um, working towards herbal education and taking herbal classes for 14 years. I have a, a cheat sheet that tells me all the things about myself. <laughs> so I have a bachelor's in biology, uh, environmental studies minor. I worked with Daryl Patton in North Alabama at the Southeastern Institute for Traditional Studies. And then I graduated from Thomas Easley's School, the Eclectic School of Herbal Medicine. I also have a certified, uh, a level one certification in aromatherapy from the New York Institute of Aromatic Studies. I am a registered herbalist with the American Herbalist Guild and that is denoted RHHG. And I've been in clinical practice for 10 years. This PowerPoint needs to be updated. <laughs> and I've seen about 700 people in a clinical setting. And like I said, I've got 14 years of training and experience and about 4,000 hours of study. And the only reason I know that is because I had to calculate and keep track of all of that for my certification. And I am the director and primary teacher for the Deep Root School of Foraging and Herbal Medicine. So tonight we're going to be covering a lot of material and I really want this to be a good primer for you guys in herbal medicine and learning um, some of the most important tenets that I like to teach when I'm teaching beginners. And so we're going to talk about the four ways of knowing. And we're going to talk about types and subsets of herbalism within the herbal culture and community, which I think a lot of times people get confused on what's a naturopath and what's an herbalist. Um, so I think that's important to go over. We're going to do really brief history, development and evolution of traditional Western herbalism. We're going to talk about how um, herbalism fits inside a model for greater health and how do we utilize, when do we know when to utilize herbs and when do we know when to utilize supplements and other modalities. Um, we're going to talk about how aromatherapy differs um, and is utilized by herbal practitioners. We're going to talk about tissue states and herbal energetics, which are really important foundational topics. And then we're also, we have so much to go. We're also going to talk about degrees of remedy. Um, we're going to talk about uh, herbal dosages and dosing different remedies. We're going to start to have develop a vocabulary for that. We're going to talk about herbal extraction options and best practices for extracting things, types of applications, and their um, when do we know when to utilize what types of preparations and then how effective are different types of preparations and then bioavailability for those. So once again, super happy to be sharing my evening with you guys. And um, 
I wanted to just kind of read my mission. So my mission statement is that I'm driven to facilitate a deep sense of place, personal empowerment, and self-sufficiency by teaching people how to connect to plants and the land. These connections anchor and remind us of our humanness, our lost culture, our part in a wider ecosystem, and our need for deep roots culturally, spiritually, and universally. And when I'm teaching, I always want to make sure that I'm tapping into this idea of kind of this rich tapestry of botanical information and knowledge. So traditional use and instinct intuition and intuition, medical science and research, and then clinical experience. Um, and I really want to make sure that I'm providing a well-rounded education, that I'm tapping into all of those things. And I really want to help create and support community and help people to connect more with the natural world. Um, so yeah. So let's talk about the four ways of knowing. So this is a concept that Paul Bergner really put into words, but it was something that I was using uh, really clearly in my own practice. And when you're utilizing herbs and you're discussing herbal medicine, it's important to recognize that just because you took an herb one time doesn't mean that you definitively know something about it. It's important to tap into multiple different ways of knowing and for those ways to corroborate each other. So when I'm talking about uh, herbalism and really understand, deeply understanding and knowing therapeutic potential and therapeutic intervention of an herb, I think it's really important to look at traditional uses, which are things like folk medicine, ancient medicine, traditional systems of medicine from all over the world. And then we have this really cool subset of old physician level herbalism. So the eclectic physicians were uh, in the United States at the turn of the century. And um, we'll talk more about them in the history of traditional um, Western herbalism, but the old physician level herbalism is also kind of lumped in with that category of traditional use. Then we've got instinct into intuition. This is a tricky one, I think, often for Westerners, and sometimes I even grapple with it, but it's this idea that we are co-evolved, um, we are intrinsically connected to plants, and we rely on them for survival, and we have for hundreds of thousands of years, and um, there's a lot we don't know, and sometimes um, plants will talk to us, sometimes we hear um, a voice in our heart that tells us, um, you know, that we're drawn to a plant. And I think that it's important to really recognize instinct intuition as a part of our deeper knowing, um, and as a part of recognizing whether we really know something about a plant. So we can't just utilize into instinct intuition by itself we have to be consulting all of these other traditions and forms of knowing. East, we talk about medical sciences and research studies. It's really important to pivot when we learn new things about herbalism. Um, I learn things new, new things every day about botanicals and how they interface with humans um, through medical sciences and research studies. And they directly inform how I practice, but you have to do that in a way that is moderated by uh, traditional uses and instinct, intuition, and um, and also the South, the South, the Southern part of the compass, which is clinical use, personal use, family and friend experiences, teachers' experiences, classmates' experiences, so other people around you, and. It's, it is so important to deeply experience plants uh, yourself and to see what friends and other teachers and, uh, you know, people that you're supporting with herbs, what they're saying about the intervention. Um, but you have to always balance that. Um, and I'll tell a story. So I did a monograph. I do a program called the Herbal Medicine Monthly Subscription. And every month we do a deep dive into a plant. And so 
Um, and I always take that as an opportunity to kind of flush out any holes that I might have in my learning. And uh, we were covering Usnia and I did a big research dive and I found out that in maybe like 15 years ago, Usnia had been being extracted and Usnic acid had been isolated from Usnia and was being put into diet and weight loss pills. And very rapidly, they started to see uh, not only liver failure, sorry, not only liver damage, but liver failure in people from overdoses uh, and high doses of usnic acid. And no one was talking about liver toxicity or a liver damage or anything involving usnia and, uh, and concern. And the dosages for those studies and those case studies for usnic acid toxicity levels were not much higher than traditional use um, dosages. It would not be incredible. You would have to try, but it would be incredibly difficult to use a high amount of usnia for two to three weeks and have some liver damage. Um, and so it deeply changed how I approached usnia. And, um, you know, I still use it, but I'm using it very clearly in acute situation, acute infective situations. And I'm using it um, for specifically the bacteria or virus that I want to kill. So it's really great at working with staph infections, particularly uh, sore throats, and also um, works really well for UTIs and the bacteria for UTIs. And so I use those in acute situations with people that don't have any liver issues. And I'm only a rec highly recommending acute use only. So two to three days at a moderate dose. Um, and so if we refuse to address or utilize or look at um, any one of these areas, we open ourselves up to a blind spot and, uh, and can be kind of arrogant. Um, and, you know, I think it's important to note, like when an herb makes you feel bad, you just stop taking it. That's intuition, that's instinct. Um, you know, in traditional use, we weren't using usnia, like no one ever used usnia long-term. It was sort of just a default. We all used it for an acute infection. Um, so, but knowing what I know now, it changes who I'm using it with and it, it makes my recommendations much more clear. Um, so anyway, I tell that story just to make sure that I'm reiterating that I think it's really important. We have a diverse way of approaching and studying and working with herbs so that we remain balanced and humble and um, also are using and utilizing lots of different ways of approaching things and learn new things all the time. So it's just a creative way of thinking and looking at um, herbal medicine. And I kind of want to talk about the strength of experiential herbalism. So somatic experience and experiencing herbs internally is, is very much a deep part of how I teach herbalism. And that's some of why I started the subscription program was because students were, there was a lot of book learning about plants, but then there was like a missing visceral component, especially when doing online programs, you just can't experience, you just don't experience chamomile and you don't experience violet. And I could talk about it all day, but when you deeply experience violet for grief or um, usnea for a UTI or chamomile, higher dose chamomile for sleep, you have a great, much greater appreciation and knowledge of that. Um, and I often think about being a physician or a pharmacist and being unable to directly ingest all of the preparations that I would be giving to someone else. Um, and I think of that as a huge bonus, beneficial, um, thing about working with herbs is that I get to deeply understand and feel how every single plant interacts with my own body. And then I give that 
free, like I feel completely comfortable explaining to someone what somatically will be happening to them when they ingest chamomile. And that gives them a really great level of comfort. And that gives me a really interesting window into a therapeutic intervention. And I think it's really crippling and hobbling when you're not able to ingest the intervention or, or try the intervention that you're recommending as a practitioner. Um, and I really, uh, I think it's a it adds a whole nother layer layer of difficulty um, to their job, and then it also it makes it much easier for me as a practitioner to be able to to feel that and to tap into that. So I think that's just important in how I approach herbalism. So let's define herbalism. So what do you think about when you hear the word herbalism? I want to see it in the chat. What do you think about when you hear the word herbalism? Mm -hmm. So Molly says she thinks about herbs being used as medicine. Good. Yeah, I'm not sure. I have the chat on. I only, you know, I can only see what I see. Oh, the chat is disabled. That's bad news. Sorry, guys. I'm sort of new to webinar Zoom. I'm used to meeting Zoom. Y'all just put your questions in the in the Q and A. I guess we'll troubleshoot that later. Um, good. So types of herbalism. So a lot of times people will think um, that, or come to me and they're like, "Are you a naturopath?" Or you know, herbalism is quackery. It's just like kitchen witch stuff. Um, and there's a bunch of different names for herbalism. And so a lot of times we have these umbrella categories that include herbalism, like alternative healthcare, um, and naturopathy is a, an umbrella that holds herbalism as well as other therapeutic interventions, just like alternative healthcare. Also phytotherapy is another name for specifically herbal medicine. Um, and herbalism is really the art or practice of using herbs and herbal remedies to maintain health and to prevent, alleviate, or cure disease. And in the United States, as a practitioner, you're not allowed to say that you are diagnosing, treating, or prescribing, or curing any um, disease. And so you need, kind of need to stay away from that language. Um, let's see. So this is for beginners. I like to simplify the idea of herbalism and kind of block it into categories that uh, when you get into higher level order of herbalism, they matter less. So I just want to, I'm just giving you, they, they overlap a lot. And so when you're first learning, it helps to kind of categorize them a little bit so that you know the differences sort of, but then there's a lot of overlap between um, these styles and types of herbalism. So I'm just gonna, just that's my caveat. So we have aromatic interventions in herbal medicine. So these are things that you smell. And obviously you can just smell the rose, a rosemary bush. You can do... Um, aromatherapy with essential oils. You can put herbs in a pot and put your head under like a steam bath. You can burn herbs like smudging. Um, moxa is using little um, incense cones in traditional Chinese medicine and to bring heat to a specific area. And it has an, air, uh, an aromatic component. And then we have, a, uh, we have energetic medicine. So this is the more esoteric 
version versions of herbalism. And we have kind of two camps of energetic herbalism. Those are flower essences and homeopathy. Homeopathy focuses on really, really diluted doses of, of herbs. So things like, um, you know, calendula will be diluted so far down that there's no physical chemical component to the plant. And it's given to people in very, very, very dilute, tiny doses. And flower essences are similar. They're an essence of the plant. You put flower petals and or whatever plant material you want in your water. You let it infuse in the sun or in the moon. And then, um, uh, and then you get that water and you make a dose bottle with that using alcohol, half alcohol and half of the water that you've made. Um, and those are two forms of energetic herbalism. And then you have herbal medicine based in the physical sense. And this is, so this is what I practice. I practice traditional Western herbalism. You've got European herbalism. You've got traditional African herbalism. There's a whole bunch of different cultures and, and tribes in Africa. They all have different ways of relating to herbs and different uh, ecosystems that they're pulling their herbs from. Native American herbalism, Campo, Ayurveda. Ayurveda is a, a, a subset or a type of herbalism practice in India. There are a bunch of other types of uh, herbalism practiced in India, but Ayurveda has kind of uh, become westernized and is over here. And a lot of people practice Ayurveda. Traditional Chinese medicine is sort of an amalgamation and uh, a cohesive um, way of treating and utilizing herbal medicine in Chinese medicine, traditional Chinese medicine. And generally what happens is people live in an area, they learn how to use those plants within the cultural context of their environment and their, and their culture, they create a system of relating to the herbs and how the herbs interface with the people in their community. And that interface is herbalism, how plants and people connect and what types of therapeutic interventions are we seeing? Um, obviously inside of this, we have uh, dietary interventions. Um, food is medicine, um, but I'm just trying to give you guys a herb focused sort of overview. Um, awesome. Okay, so history of herbal medicine in the U.S. and traditional Western herbalism. So I practice traditional Western herbalism, and I I fell into traditional Western herbalism, and I also actively choose traditional Western herbalism. And the reason for that is because um, traditional Western herbalism is native to this country and was born out of the African diaspora, the European diaspora, and then uh, the dislocation and um, suppression, repression of Native American culture and all of that strife, all of that suffering, all of those people groups being smashed together. And um, that is how traditional Western herbalism was born. So I learned from Daryl Patton and Daryl Patton was taught by Tommy Bass and Tommy Bass was a traditional folk Appalachian herbalist. And he grew up poor, very, very poor in the Southern Appalachian mountains. And he, when he was little, decided to start um, learning herbalism and he decided to start digging roots for Molly Kirby. And she was a freed slave and she was getting too old to dig roots for herself. And in her practice, she was a midwife and saw to the community. And Tommy was young and able-bodied and he started helping her and digging roots for her. And then he discovered that he could dig roots for the eclectic herbalists who were patent. This was kind of the era where there was a lot of transition in the United States away from the heroic and kind of barbaric medicine of the humors and of European or European medicine that was more Western. So it was a lot of bleeding and leeches and puking and 
cathartics and it was very heroic and it was very hurtful and it was they used mercury and there was a lot, there was a lot of heavy metal poisoning going on and um there were a couple different sets of herb, of um kind of parallel evolution of people being like hey this isn't working and people are just dying from the physicians and the interventions that they're doing and so um sort of kind of born out of that was uh, the more gentle use of herbal medicine to treat and support basically fevers. Um, and then uh, we start to see the advent of a more clinical way of relating to herbs and human beings and a more scientific way of relating to herbs and human beings. And we see that in the development of the eclectic physicians. So these were herbalist pharmacist physicians at the turn of the century in the United States that started practicing basically medical herbalism. And they deeply informed European herbalism as well. Um, and they were just an amazing group of people. And I still utilize a lot of their clinical work. Um, they made great notes. They communicated very well. They sat down and had quorums and conversations about herbalism and interventions and dosages. And they were very mechanical and methodical about how they went about using low-dose botanicals. That's, that is one of the primary ways that we know now how to utilize low-dose botanicals ethically and appropriately because of their work in making sure that we could standardize preparations and extracts. Um, and so we have, in Tommy Bass, we have eclectic physicians, we have Molly Kirby, and we have some Native American influence from being in that area. And then he was learning plants and then utilizing those um, in his own clinical practice as he got older and he, he knew hundreds of plant, hundreds of thousands of plants, thousands of plants. And, um, so I have a great passion for herbalism and a great passion for traditional Western herbalism because of sort of the alchemical, um, idea that we've through all of this suffering and all of this pain and hurt that happened in the South, we, we came together in a way to care for ourselves and our people and created this new um, way of being and relating to plants that is um, some of all of our culture. And um, anyway. It's very meaningful to me. Let's talk about herbal energetics. So first we have the energetics of the person. I'm just going to summarize real quick. We have the energetics of the person. We have the energetics of the plant. And we have the energetics of the problem the person is experiencing. So um, energetics being kind of the set point of the person's body. In a plant, it's going to be the, whether the plant is hot or cold, wet or dry, uh, tense, tensing or relaxing. That is the energetics of the plant. The energetics of the person of the disease is, is the cough wet? Is the cough dry? Is the, um, is the muscle atonic and flabby? Is the muscle too tight? Um, and where those three things interface is how, how we know what intervention to use and how well and how effective it is. So in the energetics of the person, kind of the non-woo-woo version of the energetics of a human being, how I see it is it's the genetic and epigenetic predispositions that a person has. It's learned and conditioned physiological and neurological adaptive physiologic behaviors. So to decrease the scientific jargon, it is our genetics and how our families are wired and how we're born with maybe you have freckles. Maybe your family's prone to digestive problems. Maybe everyone in your family has a bad back. 
maybe you sunburn. Like we all have these genetic predispos predispositions. And then we have environment. So what kept us safe physiologically? So if you look at a person from a lot, maybe like an Inuit person, they're going to have lots of capillaries sunk deep into their uh, body. They're not going to have very uh, superficial blood flow because they don't want to get too cold and cool their blood down. People in the tropics, their, their capillaries sit really close to this, their skin, the top of their skin, because they want to be losing heat as quickly and rapidly as possible. And so if you look at that as a good example, if you take a person, an Inuit person, and you put them at the equator, they're going to be so hot and not be able to cool down. And we're going to address that with herbs that would be cooling. Does that make sense? So that's kind of how I see the energetics of a person. The energetics of the uh, an imbalance of the problem, it has to do with kind of like I was saying, is, is your sinus infection dry? Is your sinus infection wet? Um, and then we also have neurological concerns of the imbalance and problem. So we look at tongue and we look at pulse to determine how well a person is digesting and processing food. How is their blood flow? How is their nervous system? Is their pulse erratic? Um, uh, we So pulse assessment in a more modern way of thinking is heart rate variability. And so if you're really curious about pulse assessment, you just look at heart rate variability um, and heart rate variability research. And that is pulse assessment. Human, it's just, we are looking at and feeling heart rate variability and learning about nervous system resilience by, by checking pulses. Um, and then looking at the tongue, whether the tongue is dry or, or damp, whether it has ed, uh, like scallops on the edges tells us whether the person is bloated and not draining fluid well, or whether they have inflammation, the color of the tongue is important. So we look at all of those things. And then we have the energetics of the remedy. We kind of have this broken down into three categories. So we've got, we've talked a good bit about the kind of rem remedy being hot or cold, dry or moistening, tightening or relaxing. We also need to be thinking about when we're thinking about energetics of the remedy is where is the herb most effective? So this can be thought of as like the site or location of action or an organ affinity. You'll hear a lot of people talk about that. And a lot of times this is where is that herb, where is the strongest action felt and where is the herb excreted? So there are plants like garlic, like poplar buds that you ingest them and you start breathing out the constituents in your lungs. And it, you literally can smell the herb on your breath coming out of your lungs. Allison and garlic is that way. Um, Grindelia is a, a plant that's real specific to the lungs that you can, that happens with poplar buds, poplar populus tremuloides ha that happens. You eat the plant within a couple minutes, you're breathing out all of the constituents. So when we're thinking about herbs, we want to be thinking about where's this herb excreted and where is the body going to feel the most action? Um, so I think that's important to recognize that, you know, sometimes herbs are metabolized in the liver. Sometimes they're metabolized in the kidneys. Sometimes they're excreted via the lungs. And so um, that's why we have in herbalism, this herb is really specific to the cardiovascular system, or this herb is really specific to the digestive system part and parcel because it's, it's processed there. There's more cellular receptors there. I could go down a big rabbit hole about different herbs being different, used for different um, uh, areas of the body, but that's important when we're talking about energetics of the remedy. And then the third energetics of the remedy kind of subset area is degree of action. So how strong is this remedy? Is it mild? Or is it really intense? Do we do a low dose of it? Do we do a high dose of it? Um, so yeah.
energetics of the remedy. Herbal dosing. So I want to talk more about the degrees of remedy. Sometimes I teach it in four. Sometimes I teach it in five. This chart I happen to have in five. But first degree herbal medicines are nourishing. So these are like cat broad categories of herbs that we can kind of insert herbs into so that we get a better idea as to how strong they are, how many side effects they might have, um, how quickly they might work, um, and um, you know how long we might be able to take them. So first degree herbs are nourishing. You think about them like food. They don't have broad side effects. They're generally pretty gentle. So it's like when we're hot, we want watermelon. It is a nourishing herbal. <laughs> it cools us down. If you eat too many, too much watermelon, nothing's going to happen to you. Uh, you can eat them as often as you want. They tend to be bland and minerally, and you can eat a plate of them. Think salad. So these are plants like uh, nettles and oat straw and chickweed and alfalfa. Second degree remedies, we think of like nourishing tonics. Um, little to no side effects. You can use them daily over long periods of time. They generally taste really good. Somewhere between a spice and a salad. Um, think about herbs like reishi or burdock, dandelion, holy basil, astragalus, cinnamon, garlic, raspberry leaf. Third degree are stimulating tonics. So uh, possible side effects with improper use. We would use them from days to months. They're strong, but still pleasant. To most, these are going to be like a spice. So ginseng, licorice, elruthra, rhodiola, ashwagandha, ginkgo, schizandra berry. Fourth degree remedy are specific herbs. They tend to taste strong and you tend to only want a little bit of them. Uh, you use them really only in acute situations, two to three weeks max. These are things like golden seal, myrrh, juniper, and usnium. Fifth degree remedies are heroic herbs, extremely acute use only with guided uh, by an experienced herbalist, small dosages, and tend to taste really bad. So your body, you know, you taste them and you're like, this is definitely medicine and I only need to take a little bit and I feel it really strongly. Foxglove, poke root, and lily of the valley are some examples of, of that. So this is kind of how you know, and you can do that by taste. So most often you taste like violet and you're like, that tastes really good. And I'm happy to eat that for dinner. Um, and then, you know, cinnamon is going to be a spice. You only want a smidge and you only want it occasionally, sometimes in a small amount. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have this flow chart for y'all. First degree, second degree, third degree, fourth degree, fifth degree are at the top. And then we have a tea infusion or decoction, whether it's powdered, whether we have a tincture of it, whether it's a standard extract. And this is basically like how much you should have of a first degree remedy in any of these forms. So second degree remedy, we tend to have, um, you know, very clear dosage guidelines, third degree remedy, smaller dosage, fourth degree remedy, we tend to have very small dosages. And fifth degree remedies tend to be uh, very specific dosages, mostly in tinctures. We don't tend to use low dose botanicals in any other form other than tincture because we can't dose the control the dosage very well. Herbal extracts and administration. So I'm just going to go through some herbal extracts, some types of extracts. So when um, when you're making a tea, you are technically making an infusion. Um, an infusion is when you pour water, hot water over herb. That's an infusion. 
a hot and a cold decoction. A decoction is when you let it sit. So a hot decoction is you actually let it sit and cook. A cold decoction is you let it just sit in cool water. Um, hot decoctions we tend to use for things like mushrooms, harder things, bark, things that don't extract well uh, and need some, need some cooking. Cold decoctions we tend to use uh, for minerals and mucilaginous plants. And so you generally with a cold decoction, you pour cool water over your plant material and then you put it in the refrigerator. A tincture is an alcohol-based extract and you take it orally. A liniment is an alcohol-based extract that you use topically. One of my favorite topical preparations is uh, to use in a liniment form is lobelia. I love to use lobelia topically um, for my neck and shoulders if I have a lot of tension. A glycerite is a glycerin-based extract. These are very sweet, good for kids. They don't extract very many things well. They tend to extract essential oil components and tannins really well. Um, but we tend to use those for kids, the elderly, people who have sensory issues, and if you just want to make extractions taste better. An ace extract is a vinegar-based extract. So think fire cider, if you're familiar with that. You extract medicinals and plants into your, into your vinegar. And it's another good way to get herbs into salad dressings and just add diversity to your diet and have a little fun. Um, there's the two favorite vinegar recipes are the thieves vinegar and, uh, and fire cider. So look those up if you've never used those. A um, meal is a honey extract. So you can do all sorts of fun things with honey, like a cheater chai, where you just grind up all the herbs for your chai tea and you put them straight in honey and stir them up. And when you want tea, you just grab a spoonful of your cheater chai, put it right into your hot water and you've got tea. A hydrosol is a byproduct of essential oil extraction. So it is the water produced inside an essential oil extraction. And it has small amounts of essential oil and it has a lot of acids in it. So it's great as a toner. Um, I love hydrosol, specifically chamomile hydrosol for fevers. I like using rose hydrosol for pink eye um, and as a toner. So those are some good, cool ways to use hydrosols. They're very neat. It's a cool rabbit hole to go down. Um, essential oil, we've got, so an essential oil is a very concentrated extract of only the aromatic properties of plants. So this is uh, anything that's smelly, like valerian or rosemary or mint make great essential oils. Fixed oil preparations. So these are things like a body oil. They don't evaporate readily like essential oils. They're thicker and fattier and tend to be smooth and silky when you put them between your fingers. A salve is an oil preparation with beeswax added. Those are some types of herbal extractions. So talk a little bit about administration. So we can take herbs lots of different ways, just like we take medicine lots of different ways. Oral administration is the most common, we drink it. Transdermal administration, so that's onto our skin, right? Mucosal administration is like through our mucous membrane. So say you wanna do um, a sinus rinse or a douche or um, something like that. Those are mucosal administrations. Inhalation administration, so that is essential oil. Intermuscular, we don't see a lot of this in herbal medicine. Number one, it's not, most of the time not FDA approved. There's, I'm gonna say that there's probably at least one IM administration herbal preparation by now. Um, but intermuscular is an injection to the into the muscle. Uh, IV administration. So in China, there's a, a good bit of research on um, IV administration of herbs, which is really cool. And there's actually finally this guy named Kenneth Profruck is working on uh, doing IV administration of herbs uh, in his clinic. And I think he's in New Mexico, but he's really cool. Um, and so just to broaden your horizons and let you know that's a thing, um, uh, there's some great 
uh, research out of China using, oh, I've forgotten the herb. It's left me. I'll remember in a minute. Uh, using a specific herb that starts with an A uh, for uh, renal failure. Um, and astragalus, there it is. Uh, and so utilizing astragalus intravenously for, uh, in a really specific preparation with, um, you know, specific formulations and really, really honing that, but, um, yeah. And then baths and multimodality administration. So this is, I love baths. Baths are great. You get amazing amounts of transdermal, um, action, you know, putting one of my favorite things when I'm really tense is to drink chamomile tea and put it in the bath and you're getting simultaneously inhalation because you're breathing in all the essential oil you're getting oral administration and you're getting mucosal administration and you're getting transdermal um administration and that's really some it's, it's an amazing thing to do all of them at the same time um it kind of depends on the plant as to whether that's a good idea or not but just know that administration is is important and how you get the herbs to the area is very important. So if you have a sore throat and you're taking herbs orally, but, and you're expecting them to go through your digestive tract into your bloodstream, through your liver, then all the way through your bloodstream and get into your soft tissues and then treat your sore throat, you're not going to get much intervention there. Um, but if you're doing a topical that has something like uh, propolis to help stick the anti-infective that you also put in the formula onto your throat. And then you're recommending a dosage of something like one to two sprays into the back of a throat or a gargle in the back of a throat every 20 minutes, then you're going to get some really clear um, relief and, and a very great uh, level of, of success. Um, when, uh, when you're using herbs that way, it's the same thing as a sinus infection. If you're taking herbs orally for a sinus infection, you're, you have to take a large amount. Whereas if you just put them up your nose, you're killing off local infection. You're supporting the mucous membranes. You're helping drain lymph. Um, so it's really important that when you have an infection that you're dealing with it and working with it in the most, the best way. I mean, if, if someone has cellulitis topically, I'm going to do a rinse and a, a, a soak for them. I'm not going to be giving, I might give them oral, um, herbal antibiotics too, but I'm not going to be doing just oral antibiotics. I'm going to be using internal and external and, and kind of doing all of the things that I can do to help support the person. When to know what, when to use what kind of preparation? I already went on that tangent. So um, I would say another really important note when you're first starting is that you should not put salves on deep wounds. And generally I recommend just doing soaks, doing basically an herbal tea with salt water for deep wounds of any kind and doing baths when people have uh, road rash or um, puncture wounds of any kind, you know, making sure to get antibiotics if that's necessary, making sure you're really watching the wound and then doing high um, Epsom salt soaks with, with anti-infectives herbs in them is a really great option. Um, so yeah. I'm going to go through some slides here. Um, Laura asked, is it okay to take nettle tincture on a regular basis for arthritis? Yes. Um, you will get these slides, Rachel. Uh, they're going to go out in the email tomorrow with a recording. Can we add honey to tinctures? Yes. That's a great way to add uh, some flavor and to help with the taste of them. I tend to use glycerin most often because it helps with preservation. And then also it doesn't raise blood sugar. And I'm, I always kind of thinking like a, in large scale. So I don't want to add honey to things. If they go bad, they'll go bad more quickly, but for like at home use, adding tincture and honey together is it's a great way to help get medicine in, into family members or whatever. And there, there will be a recording. 
Okay, so we'll talk about bioavailability of extractions. So when working with herbs, it's really important to note that just because maybe you picked the right herb, maybe you did some research or you got a swab of your sinus infection and you've got a sputum culture and you know exactly what infection you have and you choose your correct herb, and but you don't administer it properly, um, and it then doesn't work. So a lot of times people, when their interventions aren't working, they tend to just blame herbalism. They don't blame that they didn't pick the right herb or they didn't do the correct administration or um, the person to go off on my list, they, the person couldn't absorb the herb. So maybe um, we're working on the digestive system. We're wanting to do oh, I don't know, a nervous system intervention. So we're giving a calming herb, but maybe they pro can't process and digest that herb very well. Um, maybe they're not, they don't have good uh, gut activation or, and this is more common with, with supplements where people have a hard time absorbing supplements. Maybe they're taking uh, a form of vitamin A that they have a genetic mutation for, and they don't process that type of vitamin A. And that happens a lot with nutrients. Um, I see that a lot in clinic, uh, in my clinic work distribution. So how that herb gets distributed in the body. So, um, a good kind of, a story about that is a couple of years. I don't know. It's been a while now there was a lot of research on turmeric and turmeric was actually mostly just staying in the digestive tract and acting as a digestive tract anti-inflammatory, but it's a great systemic anti-inflammatory, which couldn't get enough into the bloodstream. And they learned that if they pair it with black pepper or piperidine, then it acts like a driver. And so just adding turmeric and black pepper together is synergistic. It makes it work much better. Um, and so that helps with distribution of the herb in the body, uh, which is why a lot of times we see traditional combinations and traditional uses. We see um, traditional combinations with black pepper. There's an herb in the South called smart weed. Um, and it's a, a, a knot weed, a polygonatum. And, um, and it has, it was called smart weed because anytime you added it to an herb formula, it made the herb formula work better. Well, guess what's in it? Piperidine. It's high in piperidine. And so um, I love it when that kind of thing happens where you see traditional uses um, being backed up by, by science. It's just really fun. Uh, metabolic rate and metabolism. So a lot of times people have the metabolism of a horse. And when you're dosing, uh, for them, then you have to dose higher. They process and digest um, herbs quickly. A lot of times I'll ask people, how do you metabolize coffee? If you drink it at night, can you fall asleep? Um, you know, how much alcohol can you drink? Um, uh, do you tend to need a lot of Novocaine when you go to the doctor to get your dent, you know, dental work done? Do you have to get a lot of it for it to work? So those are clues is that whether I need to increase their dosage from kind of a normal dosage to a higher dosage. And then excretion and elimination, how quickly are they excreting the herb? What is the half-life of the herb? How long is the herb working? So, you know, if an herb, generally speaking, especially for nervous system herbs, we're going to use them for about four hours and they'll, they'll, the person will feel the intervention for about four hours. Well, if we're only dosing holy basil, for example, once a day, when we want to calm them down all day, then we're doing them a disservice. We need to be dosing it every four hours. Um, and so that's really important. It's all very important things in kind of working with herbal medicine. Um, you can take turmeric. I'm answering questions. So someone asks, what herb is good for coughs? I really like wild cherry. Um, it kind of depends on the cough. Is the cough wet? Is the cough dry? Is the cough lingering? Uh, is the cough productive? Like, are you getting stuff up? And then I formulate accordingly. Would it hurt to take turmeric in large portions with Sorry. 
uh, with and without black pepper. You can take a bunch of turmeric. It's good for you. It is, uh, black pepper will, can be irritating if you take too much. Um, it's definitely like a lower dose. We did it. <laughs> I would love to hear more questions from you guys. Um, can peppermint essential oil be used under the tongue and is it helpful for vertigo? Yes, it can be helpful for vertigo using peppermint essential oil regularly and consistently. Um, I don't necessarily recommend it because we have high amounts of, um, you can end up with sensitivities to essential oils at a higher rate than you do other herbal medicines. Um, they're highly, uh, you do need to dilute them. I recommend peppermint is one of the essential oils that you can use neat. Lavender is also an essential oil that you can use neat and neat means without dilution. Uh, if you're going to take them orally, uh, I still think you should dilute them a bit um, and doing somewhere in the ballpark of a 50% dilution rate for peppermint and lavender essential oil. And then doing one drop of the diluted mixture is plenty. Also, if you're thinking about vertigo and talking about vertigo, a lot of times it's nervous system overload. Um, and then I would also look in, so I start working with herbs like ashwagandha, skullcap, damiana, linden, things to support the nervous system. Uh, I look for thyroid problems, anemias, um, and any neurological issues. I always recommend getting a neuro eval. And then there is an, um, a chiropractic and physical therapy kind of move called the Epley maneuver that helps recenter the bones and reorient the bones in your ear that can often cause issues with vertigo. So look up the Epley maneuver and you can actually do that yourself. Um, yes. So a lot of people are asking if, um, there's going to be a recording. There will be a recording of this sent out in an email, and I will also send out the PowerPoints. Um, so yeah. Uh, so someone asked, Hannah asked, she's not a fan of the natural taste of honey. Is there another alternative or something to aid in a different taste? So I like glycerin. Another way to hide a multitude of sins is to add tinctures and or herbal medicines to pineapple juice. Um, another way to hide herbs is to put them in the fridge and, uh, cold herbs kind of it, the coldness of them really distracts your taste buds. I order glycerin, um, online and, or from a big distributor, Azure sky is a good, um, way and place to get good, clean, um, uh, glycerin. You want to get glycerin that is not coming from, um, palm oil, you want to get glycerin that's coming from coconut husks. So just be careful about that. Uh, do I have a book recommendation for reference? Oh, I have a whole library. Um, some of my favorite ones that I reference a lot. Uh, I use Hoffman's medical herbalism a good bit. Uh, I, I call it a brain prod. I also use the botanical safety handbook. They're not infallible. Like Sometimes uh, they compiled any and all um, toxicological reports and poisonings and that kind of stuff. And so they give you um, basic therapeutic guidelines and interventions uh, as to whether you need to be careful and things like pregnancy. But occasionally they miss things because they're not going based off of clinical experience and or pharmacology necessarily. They're going on case reports quite often. So like they don't list any side effects for um, mimosa, but it's a serotonergic. And if you take it with a SSRI, you're going to have trouble. So they miss things occasionally, but it's still a really good reference. Um, uh, I like for essential oils, I have the essential oil safety guidebook by Tisserand. He's kind of the leading guy for essential oil safety. Uh, essential oils have kind of turned into a Tupperware party. So I highly recommend that book as a, a very grounding source of information. Um, I also use uh, Thomas Easley's book, The Modern Herbal Dispensatory. I'll grab that one. It's a good introductory book. 
talks, this is actually the textbook that I used for my foraging and medicine making course. Um, let's see. So yes, so a couple of people are asking about the school. Um, ba, 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 ba. Ooh, a lot of questions, let's see. Um, what herbs would you not combine together when making a tea or tincture? That's a really good question. So tannins and alkaloids will bind to each other and fall out of solution. Um, so that's a really good one to think about. So tannins are astringent tasting. So they feel like persimmons in your mouth. And then alkaloids have like a burning back of the throat kind of, uh, they taste like puke if I'm being honest. Uh, it's a very pukey flavor. And so if you combine those two tastes, uh, they'll, they'll fall out of solution and become inactive. Uh, someone asked, how long did it take to become a certified herbalist? Circuitous path. Um, I, in order to get your registered herbalist certification, you have to have supervised clinical hours with another herbalist. You have to have case studies. You have to have a certain number of hours of training. Um, and then you have to have been in clinical practice for two years. Um, when, like, if I'm recommending a school to become a clinical herbalist, I recommend Thomas Easley's school, the Eclectic School of Herbal Medicine. He has a clinical program that's really good. Um, and I, so I recommend that if you're just getting into herbalism, I highly recommend, um, the two programs that I have. So I do a foraging and medicine making intensive and the, uh, herbal medicine subscription program. So let's talk about those. So that's my program that's coming up. I have an in-person foraging and medicine making intensive. It's in central Alabama. I hosted at Tannehill State Park. Registration is open. I always offer payment plans for people. And um, this program teaches you how to make anything that you would want to make. So we cover how to make tinctures and glycerites, tea blends, honey extracts, everything that we talked about tonight. Herbal, I even make herbal jello and cookies. We make acorn flour, lip balms, body scrubs. We make hydrosols. We talk about making oil, essential oil-based preparations. These are pictures from class of us extracting usnea. And um, I think that that is rose glycerite. So you, not only do you know how to make everything, but you also know how to extract them really well. Um, we also do plant walks. So we spend um, at least a couple of hours every time that we meet and we do plant walks. Um, we go out and around the area. And what's nice is because this class is over the course of four months, you get to see a change in season. And we talk about different plants coming up during different parts of the year. Um, we talk about distinguishing characteristics and properties and uses. And so it's an amazing way to learn foraging and herbal medicine and making medicine at the same time. At the end of class, this you end up with a medicine chest of preparations from class. So this image is just from one day of class. So we made a facial oil, a solid perfume, a salve, a muscle rub, and an essential oil preparation for your nose called a nausea. Um, and so by the end of class, you have a full medicine cabinet full of things that you've made from class, which is really neat. I teach you for about 48 hours of 48 hours of instruction. I warn you about pitfalls. We talk about stories about how my clinical gleanings, how to um, my failures in herbal medicine and make, making mistakes, um, you know, learning that you can combine tannins and alkaloids. Um, I, I, I try to help make your journey in herbalism easier. Uh, in the course material, I, it's, I've been teaching this class for 10 years and every time that I teach it, I add something new to the course material. So it's been being honed for 10 years. Um, it's about 250 pages. I have charts, I have graphs, I have recipes. I have 
everything that you're learning so that when in five years you can go back and reference your notes. And I still have students that occasionally will send me messages and be like, thank you for their, your amazing notes <laughs> because they go back and reference them. Um, and so I think as adult learners, it's important for us to do that. I also do a lot of um, quizzes and integration exercises so that you're not just coming to class, learning, and then forgetting about it. Um, and so it's an amazing program. And um, and I will make sure in the email that I send you guys, um, I will send send you guys uh, a link. And actually, I'm wondering if I can get you a link right now. Brenda, please. So I only have about 10 more spots for that class. And, um, there's the link for it. I I do it. Um, so did you guys get that in the chat? It seemed like a couple of people were saying that chat was enabled. Oh, I figured out how to enable the chat. Okay, there we go, everyone. The chat is open <laughs> and it has a link in it. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in that course, um, it's amazing. Does anyone have questions about the course? Let's see. So I'm getting a lot of questions about accommodations. So the course only meets one weekend per month for four months. So you, people from out of town can come and I host it at Tainel State Park. So that means that there are cabins you can rent, there are RV sites you can rent, you can stay in a tent, and then it's only 40 minutes away from Birmingham. So if you want, you can stay at an Airbnb there. Um, I've had people come from Biloxi. I've had people come from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, I've had people come from Tennessee. Uh, so, you know, it's very doable for a lot of my students. And then if you make friends with people in class, y'all can just rent a cabin together. Um, and so those are all really good ways and to make the course accessible and in a way that I try to, I try to accommodate people from out of town. Um, let's see. Um, other questions? Any purchase of course materials? Uh, so I don't offer the course materials for sale without the course. Um, let's see. So a lot of people are asking about other options to learn. So I also offer an herbal medicine monthly subscription. So in the subscription, I go through and teach you one plant per month. So the reason I developed this program is because my students kept like, I would finish a plant walk and people, that was so great, but I, I can't remember anything you said. I don't feel confident foraging for this plant and I don't know how to use it. And I don't, I just don't feel comfortable. I don't know enough to feel comfortable guinea pigging myself or my family. And so I, I realized that I just needed to do and focus on one plant per month. And then eventually you have a full apothecary and you know how to use all of those plants. And so 12 a year. And so I started a program and I teach you how to identify the plant, forage for it. I, look, I tell you about common lookalikes. I do a recorded video of me foraging and harvesting it. Um, we, I do a live monthly online class where we all get together and you can taste the herb with me. You get a kit every month where I send you a tincture and a salve or tea of that plant so that you can taste it while you're learning about it, which is super important to me. And then I also go through and do a research review. I tell you stories about my clinical experience. I teach you 
its chemical constituents and what they do, its therapeutic interventions, everything that you would want to know about the plant and how to use it. And I also give you a printable flashcard so that you can quiz yourself and you have access to dosages. I, we do assessments. You can get a Materia Medica 1 and 2 certification. All you have to do, I have two different integration exercises and a quiz every single um, plant. And so you, you can, I've had people have their kids in it for homeschool assignments. Um, I have, uh, I've got 80 people in the program right now doing the uh, subscription with the kit. And then I have a couple of people, I think maybe 20 in the digital only. So if you're a professional herbalist and you don't want the herb, that's fine. Don't it's $19 for the subscription, the digital subscription without, and it is, um, uh, $37 for the, the subscription with the kit. And then you just pay for shipping. So every month we get a kit. So this is a picture of the kit. This is red clover tincture, red clover glyceride, red clover salve, and then tea. Um, I, I real always shoot for about uh, two ounces of uh, preparation that goes into each kit, unless the herb is particularly expensive or more low dose. Um, so every month you're going to be growing your apothecary and experiencing the plant and tasting herbal medicine that you know is made by somebody who knows what they're doing. So then when you go buy some herbs from someone else and you taste it and you're like, mm, that's not as good. That's not a good preparation. Um, an in-depth monograph. So um, I cover, it's seven to 10 pages. It's super jam-packed full of information. And then I also read it to you. So you have an MP3 that you can listen to in the car and there's an app as well. Um, I, like I said, I cover foraging identification uh, information in the videos. And then we always meet once a month and get together. And it's a great way to form community. And, and then here's kind of the breakdown of that. So it's $19 a month for, and uh, for the digital only, and then it's $37 a month for the digital and, um, and the subscription, sorry, <laughs> I'm getting tired. The digital subscription in the kit every month. Um, so I am. I have messaged everyone in the chat. The first link is the um, foraging and medicine making course. And then I'm about to do the And here is the link for the subscription program. The subscription's already gone out for this month. Um, so if anyone wanted a subscription, um, so I'm gonna, um, open it up for questions. Is anybody seeing the chat now? Oh, yay. Okay. Woo. What a relief. Sorry, guys. Kind of getting my bearings here. Okay. So the first link that I sent is um, for the foraging and medicine making course. And like I said, I only have 10 spots. And then the subscription program, I also have to cap. I have 80 people in it now. It has already gone out for this month. If you enroll now, you will get a kit starting in July. Um, 
but I still, I can, I only can offer spots to 120 people. So it's a cap. So if you want to do um, that program, then you need to sign up as soon as possible. Um, and I, uh, I will also send these links out in the email tomorrow. Um, okay. Now that we have chat available, <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you for your grace, everybody. Um, where in central Alabama, Birmingham, but I teach mostly at, uh, Tannehill State Park for the, um, the medicine making course. And then I do plant walks, um, once a month at Moss Rock Nature Preserve. Oh, cool. Yay. We got some people signing up for the kit. All right. Hit me up with some questions now that our chat is live. Thank you, God. Babies. What about babies? How to dose for babies? There's Young's rule and there is um, how to dose for teething. I love chamomile. I love chamomile for teething for babies. You can pretty much give them as much as you want. I like one to two droppers full um, for teething for babies. Ear infections, I do chamomile orally, two droppers full. Um, I also, for fevers, I love chamomile hydrosol. Works like a champ um, for babies, for fevers. You just spray them down, um, which is really convenient because they're very grumpy when they have a fever and it's really hard to get them to take things. Um, so you can do a chamomile bath. I like hydrosols. I think they're super great. A lot of people use essential oils on babies and I just, it's just, it's beyond me. Their liver, it, essential oils go topically into your body and essential oils are super duper strong. And so when, uh, when you're putting them on a baby, it's, it's just, it's too much. It's like a bazooka. Um, so hydrosols are a really great option for babies and then doing a glycerin based extracts for babies. Um, what did you say about quizzes and certifications in relation to your subscription? So inside the subscription, you have the option to do um, uh, the assignments and, and the assignments are for integration. So I have two assignments for integration exercises per plant. And then you also can do um, uh, a quiz. And then if you submit both integration exercises and the quiz for each plant, and you do 12 plants that you submit and do all of the course material for, then you can get a level one certification, materia, materica, sorry, materia medica one level certification. And then if you do 12 more plants, you get materia medica two certification. Um, where are the plants from the kit from? I'm in zone five. Um, I forage all over Alabama and Alabama has a very diverse, um, botanical, um, it has diverse botany. So because we have a bunch of different soil strata. So, um, it pretty much if you live in Alabama, it really, if you live in the South, you're going to be able to grow and, or harvest whatever plant I'm using and sending to you in the subscription. Um, Awesome. I see some people signed up. Uh, best herb for impacted sinus cavities. I love doing, um, I like doing poke topically, poke root tincture topically. Um, uh, it depends on like, do you have like the ice pick sinus infection thing happening? Um, I tend to do oral, honestly, fire cider. It really opens you up and kind of burns but uh, don't put it up your nose. <laughs> Do fire cider orally. Try that. Um, you've got Hashimoto's. What do you recommend for thyroid support? An autoimmune paleo diet is what I recommend for thyroid support. Oh, really for Hashimoto's. Focus on autoimmunity and immune regulation. Do astragalus and mushrooms that regulate immune function. Restless leg, uh, magnesium deficiency. Do magnesium glycinate, a thousand milligrams, 500 in the morning, 500 at night. See if your restless leg goes away. Help for sciatica, topical, um, 
uh, topical St. John's wort, and then look up nerve flossing. Plants for diabetes. I'm sorry, I'm not just an herbalist. I'm also a functional herbalist. So I'm trained in diets and supplements. So it's really, I'm really hard pressed to give you just herbal advice um, when it you need more than that. Um, so herbs for di diabetes, I'm type two. Um, and I do intermittent, um, high intensity intermittent interval training. So that helps insulin resistance a lot. Holy basil is amazing for helping with insulin resistance. And then berberine HCL is a concentrated berberine extract that I use to help lower and regulate blood sugar. And it's great. Also a little bit of cinnamon and then huckleberry is fabulous. Psoriasis. I focus on liver function and cleansing the liver. So I like burdock, um, dandelion root and, um, milk thistle. Milk thistle is contraindicated in anemias. So if somebody has anemia, you don't want to take the milk thistle with the iron that you're trying to fix the anemia with. Um, uh, if you can't make it to the July through October foraging and medicine making course, then you can do the next one starts in January of next year, 2024. But because I teach this twice a year, if you, I don't like it when people miss the first course because it's so foundational, but if you have to miss like the second one, then you just make it up when I run it again. And I already have the dates. So you just put it in your calendar that you're going to come you know, February, if you miss the second class, if you miss the August class in 2023, you're going to come to the February class in 2024. And that's generally what um, I do. Is your subscription the same teachings as your monthly gatherings for medicinal herbs? I'm going to answer what I think you mean by that. So I do plant walks and I teach about lots of different plants. And then uh, I teach for the subscription is its own thing. And, um, I don't, uh, I do a private class for the subscription program where we, where it's just students in the subscription program, where we talk about one, the one plant per month. Um, plant walk. Oh, I am having a plant walk on Saturday this Saturday from 10 to 1130 at Moss Rock Nature Preserve. You can go to my link tree on my bio, on Facebook or Instagram. Uh, and you can, um, uh, you can do that. For the plant walk on Saturday, should one print out the guide you emailed to take notes on? Sure, yeah, I'm assuming you're talking about the, my Materia Medica um, like notebook that I, give people in an email sign up for free, but yeah. Uh, will you send seeds? No, I don't, I don't send seeds very often. I have thought about it, but sometimes it's just too much. Suggestions for asthma. Kind of a big thing. I like just generally supporting the lungs. I like N-acetylcysteine as a supplement. Um, and then, uh, Mullen. I like lobelia for asthma attacks. Grindelia, if there's a lot of gunk and congestion. And then I look at histamine issues and see if anybody, if we need to do something like holy basil for histamine issues. Uh, someone 50 battling acne, what's your suggestions? Focus on liver and detoxification. So I said, I gave advice to someone for psoriasis. It's kind of the same. So you're going to do burdock and um, uh, milk thistle and, um, milk thistle. dandelion root are three really good ones. Red clover is also a really good one. You kind of focus on alternatives is the kind of brand and type of herb you want to focus on when you're working with skin manifestations of, um, and, and skin manifestation manifestations and issues, ADD and ADHD. Raise his hand. I love Shizandra Lobelia. I sort of do a combination of uppers and downers and serotonergics. So I like milk. Um, sorry. I like mimosa flower and bark combined with Shizandra, combined with Damiana, combined with skullcap, combined with passion flower, um, combined with saffron. Fibro suggestions like fibrotic things or like 
fibromyalgia. Honestly, a whole lot of my clients respond really well to just drinking more water, which I know sounds very flippant and crazy. Focus on doing a little salt in your water and do cross vine tea. Look up cross vine tea. If you join the subscription program, I have a whole monograph on cross vine, but cross vine to help hydrate the connective tissue and the nerve so that because nerves are highly irritated when they're dehydrated. And I've seen so many, I'm going to say like 30% of the fibromyalgia people that I've seen in, in clinic resolve from drinking water and doing heavy and doing cross vine tea to help rehydrate the connective tissue. So try that first. And then of course, shoot me a message. Um, contain all this information and so on. <laughs> I don't know how you could contain all this information for so long. You're only 22. Hello. <laughs> I'm 33, but yeah, I feel old sometimes. Um, um, gladium toxicity from MRI contrast. I'm going to say that you need to go to a specialist focus, uh, uh, look up a functional medicine physician that specializes in heavy metal toxicity because you need help. You need someone who is trained in how to do that. Um, best herbs and remedies for severe environmental respiratory allergies. Whew. Look into and dive into the rabbit hole of mast cell activation syndrome and start working on, use an enzyme called DAO, look up probiotics that support DAO enzyme production, and um, do holy basil, fresh holy basil, grow it this year, and do tea fresh as much as you can um, for your allergies destiny. Um, suggestions for mixed connective tissue disease and symptom management. Solomon seal, half Solomon seal tincture, half cross vine tincture, taken two droppers full three times a day. Overactive bladder syndrome, oof. Um, topical gelsemium. Uh, anytime the nerve is overactive, we wanna calm it down. So um, I, I do, I like gelsemium topically, which is a low dose botanical, I'm so sorry. Uh, so it, it'll be hard to find. That's all I'm saying. I'm sorry. Uh, so there, are, let's see, Valerie has a question. The medicine making course, she says, is there two parts and July through October is the first? No, July through October is the whole course. I run it twice a year. So I run two iterations of it every year. And so I have one matriculating class, 25 people from July to October, then they finish their graduated. And then I run it again from July or sorry, January. February, March, April, to January to April um, for the next matriculation. So um, let's see, high blood sugar. Can you send the name of the herb for high blood sugar in my email? Uh, high blood sugar, berberine HCL, suggestions for migraines, butter burr, it can be toxic. Low dose, I like doing, um, it depends on the migraine. That's kind of a complicated one. I'm sorry. I, I feel like I can't give you pointed uh, information unless I have more details. Um, hair regrowth, rosemary rinses. Oh, I have a herbal multivitamin recipe somewhere on my Facebook page. Good luck. But I like doing things like nettle and marshmallow and... Um, because I'm a dry person and oftentimes mineral rich herbs are drying, um, I have a hard time with that. So I always add things like slippery elm or marshmallow root or licorice into my mineral teas, but things like milky oats are high in minerals, um, oat straw, uh, nettles, seaweed, um, burdock is pretty high in minerals. Um, bad allergies. I start with holy basil and then the DAO enzymes. Um, also, let me just go ahead and send you guys over. I have a, on my website, I have access to practitioner 
um, brands of supplements and I give everybody 35% off because I think that supplements should be cheap and available. Um, so you're going to go to my, um, my website and then it says at the top in the search bar, order supplements. And you're going to order supplements from that dispensary that are really high quality. Um, somebody asked uh, about the medicine, the herbal medicine monthly subscription. It is available. Um, I, I record everything in it and all of the information that we learn and it's all available in an online classroom and there's an app too, and it's really accessible. I do like, uh, hibiscus, um, as a hydrator as well. It is a little drying sometimes for some people. Ellers Daniels, um, I use, um, to Ann Dyer, uh, <clears throat> I use Solomon Seal and Crossbind 50-50 mix as the first, um, first thing to try. Angie M, do I meet with individuals and assess their issues and help treat them? Not anymore. I don't do clinic work actively right now. I just needed a break. Um, and, uh, but I highly recommend the Eclectic School of Herbal Medicine. Uh, they have a free clinic. And then a good friend of mine also has really amazing training and is as good a clinician as I am, if not better, Alyssa Dallos with Alabama Functional Herbalism. Uh, we did good. Did I just answer almost everybody's questions? <laughs> Feeling accomplished. Um, so if the subscription program, if you sign up for the subscription program today, you're not gonna get your kit until the 1st of July. And that's just gonna be where you're billing occurs. And then when you cancel, you'll get an extra kit after you're done canceling. Like, does that make sense? So we just resolve like, okay, you've paid, paid in June for July. Um, there's just, I don't know a better way to do it, but I, I just shipped today. So I can't add anybody in and, and I have to prep all the herbs, um, ahead of time. So I can't, you know, it, it helps me a lot if you all sign up now so that I know I have to plan for another 40 people or whatever um, in uh, the um, in the program. So my Facebook, somebody wanted, oh, I'm assuming that maybe just sending you the link tree would be helpful. Um, there's my link tree. And that the link tree has links to everything. So the subscription and the forging and medicine making intensive and my plant box and my schedule and everything. Um, someone else asked for, oh, Alaska. I don't know. Uh, so the school that has the free herb clinic is the eclectic school of herbal medicine. Awesome. Okay. It seems like questions have slowed down. Um, in Texas, uh, Sam Kaufman is an amazing herbalist and he is in, I think, Austin, Texas. Strengthening the heart for heart murmur, night blooming Saris. Look up David Winston. He has some heart tonics. Arizona, I don't know anybody. Colorado, don't really know anybody. Eastern Kentucky, don't really know anybody. Sorry. Eczema is going to be the same advice that I gave somebody for psoriasis. Um, yeah. Michigan? No, sorry. Oh, oh, Jim McDonald is, I think, in Michigan, and he's amazing. Florida, Susan Marianowski and the Florida School of Herbal Medicine. But also, we have a lot of similar plants, so you can learn from me. 
Ohio, Illinois, y'all are hilarious. Every state in the country. Um, I don't know anybody in Ohio or Illinois either. Jim McDonald is going to be like best Midwesterny, I think. Um, so that's look up Jim McDonald. He's great. Oh, Sam Thayer is amazing, but yes, he's mostly foraging and not so much herbal medicine. He's like intro herbal medicine. Um, the, everyone who is signing up for the herbal medicine monthly subscription, please go check your delete, your trash email. For some reason, my data by my, my emails go straight into people's trash. So go to your trash, mark them as important and pull them out and you'll get all of the information that you're supposed to have. Um, I don't know anybody in Tennessee. I don't know anybody in Orange County. Also, Tennessee, you're just, you should just hang with me. Um, where can we access the recording of the Zoom? The Zoom is going to be in an email that goes out tomorrow morning at like 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. Also, before you guys leave, tell me what you want to see more of because I teach a free class every single month. I do a free webinar every month. And um, so please send me a list of things you want me to do classes on. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Oh, that's neat. Yeah, we kind of blew up on Facebook like really fast. Um, mental health and neurodivergence would be hell amazing. Okay, cool. I am going to start posting any of the free classes that I've ever done. I'm going to start adding them to the a YouTube channel. And so go to YouTube. We are, we have a channel, the Deep Root School of Forging and Herbal Medicine. So go join or add or like, or whatever it is that channel. And very soon I'm going to be adding classes that I've previously taught, especially the Zoom ones that I'm doing, the free ones. And I have a great one um, on stress and it will gloss over neurodivergence, but um, it's still applicable and helpful. Uh, it's called Herbal Reboot. And I did it in January at the cusp of the year. And um, and that one is going to be, uh, I will put it on the YouTube channel as soon as I have capacity to do so. Uh, love this. Is it different every month? This Zoom? Yes, I will teach a free class every month on Zoom. It's around the beginning of the month. I tend to do it on a Tuesday night at the beginning of the month. How many people are on this webinar? A lot. Uh, at the peak, it was like a hundred. Um, I had 500 people sign up though. Let's see. Oh, y'all are sweet. Thanks for coming. Oh, all right, y'all. We've answered a lot of questions. We've covered a lot of ground. And I really appreciated hanging out with you guys. And um, yeah, see you next month. Now y'all are, will get emails from me from doing this class. So you'll get, I don't spam people. I pretty much just send like, hey, I'm doing a course registrations open or hey, I'm doing a free webinar. So awesome. Thank you guys so much. I've so appreciated hanging out with y'all and, um, and the support and just, you know, join my email newsletter, like follow, share on Facebook, make sure that you're seeing me and you say you want to see me so that you get notifications about free classes. And, um, and I'm excited for you guys who are joining me in, in my programs and, um, and I'll see you soon then. <laughs> All right, y'all. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.